uh, that we could look at. Uh, and, but in spite of that, I've enjoyed the things we've been able to look at as, and learn. Here in Job chapter 1, verse number 9, let's stand together as we read our text. It says, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? And let's again have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for each one here tonight, and we thank you for uh, just the good day you've given us, and uh, Lord, the many blessings that you've uh, brought our way today. We pray that uh, you would bless as we look into your word, help us to have open ears and open hearts, and uh, Lord, help us not just to learn uh, things about uh, your word, just facts. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to learn practical things for our daily walk with you. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would just bless in everything that's said and done tonight. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. So we, uh, we looked last week at Job that he was a real historical figure and he was considered to be such in both the Old and New Testaments. We, we mentioned that. And we talked about the fact that the book of Job deals with the problem of suffering, especially as it bears on the life of a believer. And uh, part of it is the causes of suffering. Part of it is uh, the response or reaction to suffering. Uh, a lot of different aspects, as we will see, and as we have already seen. And we looked last week at how he faced calamity. Uh, because to begin with, Job was blessed. God had blessed him with uh, a lot of material goods, a lot of material things. And uh, all at once, he was crippled by bankruptcy. In other words, all those things that God had blessed him with, God took away. And he had, he had a very good response to that. Uh, I love his response in uh, verses uh, 20, uh, actually verse 21. Uh, he said in verse 21 of Job chapter 1, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So the idea of what he's saying is, look, it's, it's all the Lord's. The Lord gave it to me. So it was the Lord's, and the Lord took it away from me. It was, it was always the Lord's. I was just the steward. I was just the caregiver, as it were, for those things in the time that I had them. And so it's always the Lord's. And, and that was a very good response. And it was a right response. Then we saw that uh, in chapter 2, he's covered with boils. And uh, the devil, it, you know, obviously wasn't satisfied with Job's losses because Job didn't respond the way the devil wanted him to. And so that's what happened. And then... Uh, he was cursed with bitterness. His wife became bitter. Uh, she became very bitter over the whole situation, all the loss, because he had a right response. He had a right heart. She didn't, and uh, we talked about that last week as well. Uh, but he had done well, and you don't hear from Satan for the rest of the book. He's gone. He's done. Uh, James 4, 7 tells us that if we resist the devil, he will flee from you, and that's what happens. Now, uh, was that fast? No. There was some time that elapsed here uh, in, in before the devil ran away. So it's not a devil, you know, get thee behind me, and he runs away. That's not how, that's not reality. And that's not what happened with Job. There was some time uh, that elapsed here. Uh, but nonetheless, now he's taken out of the hands of Satan. He is placed in the hands of men. So here come his quote-unquote friends. Uh, and, and I say that in quotes because when we look at them, they did not act like friends act. Now, uh, whenever you will notice, whenever you have problems, whenever you are suffering, you will notice that many of your quote-unquote friends will respond just like these three men did. And actually four, all four of them. Uh, and, and you'll find that... Uh, uh, you, you find quite often who your real friends are when you get into suffering. Um, there's another thing I'm thinking, but I'll save that till next week because I'm sure we're not going to finish tonight. But you see how he faced criticism because that's what his quote-unquote friends did. They criticized him, uh, and, and they said terrible things about him. Uh, the only good thing you could say about them saying all these terrible things about Job 
is that they said it to his face. You know, at least they weren't behind his back. Oh, Joe, can you believe that? He's this and he's that. So uh, that wasn't going on at least. Uh, but nonetheless, it wasn't a good situation either. So let's look at Job and the critics here. So here, Job is the man who had triumphed. He triumphed over the calamity that befell him. And he triumphed over the devil who's provoking him to curse God. And yet he falls flat on his face before those who are his friends. Uh, so much of the criticism here is untrue. Much of the criticism is unfair in what they say. But God used it to show Job some things, uh, the hidden things of darkness. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And verse number 5 says this, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. And of course, <clears throat> this is an admonition, uh, much like we talked about Sunday afternoon, uh, for us not to be judging or condemning, as we talked about Sunday, uh, someone else when, look, they're going to stand before God and answer for whether they were right or not what they were doing. But nonetheless, God can and God does search out the things that are in our heart. Look over in uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and uh, verses 12 and 13. See, this is what the Word of God does for us. When, when In times of suffering, what do many people do? Well, I'll tell you what many people do. They put down their Bible. Oh, I'm hurting too much to read my Bible. Well, let me tell you, when you're suffering, that's the time you need more than any other time. Not that there's any time you shouldn't, but that's the time you need to be holding on to your Bible and reading it and allowing the Word of God to work in your heart. There's, there's never a time that we need to lay aside the Word of God. You know, oh, things are going really good. I don't need to read my Bible. No, that's not true uh, because uh, it may look good, but we don't know what's coming around the corner. And if we lay aside our Bible when, when we think things are good, we're not going to be ready when we turn around the corner and there's a semi running us over. And I'm saying that metaphorically, obviously. But nonetheless, uh, we, we need that. And then in hard times... We need the Word of God because the Word of God gives us comfort. And that we miss that. Well, I'm hurting so bad I can't read my Bible. Then we miss the comfort that God has for us uh, when we do that. So there's never a time to do that. But here in Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 12 and 13, it says this. <clears throat> for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifested in sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. What does all that mean? That means that God and also God's word can see into the hidden corners of your heart and knows what's going on. But of course, the Word of God is also our light, is it not? And so as such then, the Word of God knows what's in the hidden corners of our heart, and it shines a light there. That's what's going on with Job. There were some things there. Yes, Job was a good man. Yes, he loved the Lord, but there were still some things there that should not have been. But they're hidden away in the corners. And, and sometimes we have the idea, well, as long as it's hidden away in the corners, it's okay. Because nobody looks in the corners. You know, because when you have dim lighting, you know, like if, if, you've, if you've ever lived, like when you go camping, for example, and you have a kerosene lantern, like if you're poor. Or even if you have a Coleman lantern, you know, and you use that. How much light do you get out of that? Just not a whole lot. Um, I, I can remember when that's all the light we had was kerosene lanterns. And no, I'm not that old, so don't even go there. <laughs> but, but I have lived where we didn't have electricity, and that was the light that we had. We had kerosene lanterns. And there were a lot of corners in our house you just could not see until the sun came up. 
you know, and that's just how it was. And uh, so if you're gonna clean the house by lamplight, it's gonna look real clean real fast because you can't see that. But the Word of God's not that way. The Word of God is like a floodlight that just brightens up the whole thing. And all of a sudden you see all the things that you thought were covered, that you thought weren't there. Have you ever done that? My uncle used to tell a story about the first car that he bought. It was in Kansas City, Missouri. And if you've ever been to Kansas City or anywhere around there, because the Missouri River runs between Kansas City, Missouri and Kansas City, Kansas, it's all, it's hilly up and down and this and that. So anyway, he's gonna buy his car, his first car, it's like 16 years old or something like that. And uh, my granddad was a taxi cab driver. He knew about cars because of, you know, he drove all the time. My uncle didn't ask my granddad, what should I get, where should I go, what kind of car should I get, no. He's got, you know, 20, 30 bucks, I don't know. He had, he's got some money, because you know this is back almost before the Great Depression. It's a long time ago. Uh, probably about 1940, 42, 43. And uh, so he goes to this used car dealer and he says, I wanna buy a car. And the dealer says, like every salesperson says, how much money you got? And my uncle, who it's kind of hard to believe he did this, he told the man, now, my uncle was known for his wheeling and dealing. He, in my lifetime, he never did that. But uh, anyway, at that time, he'd you know, live and learn, and he hadn't lived, and so he hadn't learned. And so he told the salesman how much money he had, and the salesman said, I've got the car for you. Come out back. And so they went around back into the shed. The guy couldn't hardly open the door, so there's hardly any light shining in. And my uncle looks at the car and, oh, well, it's got four wheels, steering wheel. Looks like it's got a motor there. Must be great. Gave the salesman the money. And the salesman said, I'll give you a warranty until it gets off the lot. That's what he told him. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, nowadays, we'd, we'd know better. I mean, I would hope so. And so he said he didn't even make it home. And again, I told you. Kansas City, it's hills. So he's pushing his car up the hill and then trying, trying to make sure he didn't run into everybody over going down the other side. And don't you know my granddad had something to say when he got home and found out that my uncle bought this junker. <laughs> That's what the Word of God does. You see, a lot of times we go into situations in our life, we look at certain areas of our heart and of our life, and we say, yeah, that's pretty good. There's nothing wrong there. But when we allow the word of God and we allow God to take his word and to shine the light all over in every corner of our heart, all of a sudden we begin to see the cobwebs. We begin to see the dust because we have it maintained. And that's the thing about a Christian life. It has to be maintained. You don't just fix it up one, you know, one and done. If you don't maintain, it gets dusty. It gets cobwebs, it gets dirty, and it starts looking old and worn out before it's time. And, and so that's what the Word of God does for us. It lets us see the issues that need to be dealt with. And that's what God is about to do with Job here. Job, he harbored bitterness. He harbored pride. He had some sarcasm that he vents as well. Not in a good way. He's got anger, impatience, and self-righteousness. He's got all these problems, but he didn't know it because everything's good. Everything's happy. Every, everything's just going along smooth. God had to bring these things into his life to bring out these problems. And God's going to have to do the same thing with you at some point. That's what happens when you refine silver and gold. It has to go through the fire. It has to go through what's uncomfortable bring the dross to the top so it's cleared off and so that that gold and that silver can be purer and more valuable. And that's what God has to do with us. And that's what he's about to do with Job. And here come these three friends. They came to sympathize and they stayed to sermonize. That's what they did. We all need friends like that, don't we? Um, <laughs> 
the bad thing is when we are that friend. But here's Eastern <laughs> culture. This, this is an interesting thing here. Um, let me see. In um, chapter 2, and verse 13, it says, So they sat down with him. These three friends come. They sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him. For they saw that his grief was very great. Now, in Eastern culture, uh, Oriental courtesy demanded that Job be the first to speak. Well, he's not saying anything, and he's trying to wait them out. You ever had that happen? <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he was trying to wait them out uh, because he, he knew them. He said, oh, no. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, this is not good. Misery loves company, but not that kind of company, you know. And so they, they sat in silence for a whole week. <laughs> they didn't go anywhere. And Joe's like, are they going to ever go? No. But again, God's trying to do something here. So you have, first of all, Eliphaz. He's the first one to uh, begin talking to Job in chapter 4. And he liked to talk about spirits and visions. He felt that no one was right unless they had the same experiences that he had. You ever known anybody like that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've, I've known quite a few people that way. You know, they always, they, you know, you know if, if you hadn't been where they were, you hadn't seen what they've seen, done what they've done, then you are really subhuman and subpar. And uh, that, that's kind of how Eliphaz is. He suggested that Job must have been a great sinner. Otherwise, these things would not have happened to him. In other words, what he's saying is, it's possible you've sinned. It's possible you've done something wrong here. So let's look at this in chapter 4 and verse 3. Behold, thou hast in, uh, instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Drop down to verse 5. But now it is come un, uh, upon thee, and thou faintest. It toucheth thee, and thou art troubled. Boy, what a comfort. Look at verse 7. Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off? Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and so wickedness reap the same. What is he saying? He's saying, I don't know, but it might be that there's sin here. That's kind of what he's saying. Chapter 5 and verse 17. Here he goes on. Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. It might be that you're being chastened by God. It might be. So it's possible you've seen. That's Eliphaz. Bildad, he's the man with the clever cliches. And he's far worse than Eliphaz because uh, Eliphaz only suggested that Job was a sinner, a great sinner. But Bildad supposed. I mean, it's essentially, he's just kind of assuming uh, that this is how it is. So instead of saying it's possible that you've sinned, now Bildad is saying it's likely. So, I mean, it's progressively getting worse now. So, you know, Eliphaz, he's done. I'm done talking now. I just washed my hands of the whole thing. I'm going to let Bildad talk. And, and uh, great. Uh, look here in chapter 8, Job chapter 8 and verse 3. Uh, here Bildad is talking, and it says, Doth God pervert judgment, or doth the Almighty pervert justice? Look at verse 6. If thou art pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. So, yeah, it's pretty likely, you know, considering God's not saving you out of your problems, it's pretty likely you're just a sinner. You're just a no-good, ugly sinner, and, and uh, you know, I just feel sorry for you, that's all. Verse, uh, obviously you didn't feel sorry for him at all. Verse 11, uh, can the rush grow up without mire? Can the flag grow without water? Whilst it is yet in his greenness and not cut down, it withereth before any other herb. So are the paths of all that forget God, and the hypocrite's hope shall perish. So, again, yeah, it's pretty likely, because this is what happens. This is how God works, and man, look at your life. Yeah, it's pretty likely. You're, you're a great sinner, and you, you sin. So, uh, Bildad, he's the kind of guy, he's got a pat answer for everything. And we all know people like that. Uh, but uh, it, it doesn't matter what's going on. He's got an answer. Sort of like the guy. Uh, we, my dad hired a fella to help him learn uh, the trade language there in New Guinea. And uh, so that mom had bought this book in town. And it was, it was actually a trilingual book. We didn't realize it at the time. 
Uh, but anyway, it's supposed to be all different recipes um, from there in, in uh, Papua New Guinea. So, you know, how to cook grubs um, that actually was in there. Um, but how to cook grubs, how to cook uh, wild sugar cane. And let me tell you, wild sugar cane is not something good. That is the nastiest. Anyway, <laughs> sugar cane is good. Now, that, that's fine. But wild sugar cane, that's just a whole other. I, it's just a weed is all it is. Um, but anyway, the, on the front, it had uh, food, and then it had kai kai, which is the, the pigeon word for food, and then it had another word that said ani ani. And so we're, we're like, what, what is this? I mean, we understand food, we understand kai kai, you know, we know what that is, I mean, because that's the same thing. What is this ani ani thing? What, what is that? And so here's this guy that dad had hired to be his teacher to help him learn the language. And so dad asked him, what is this? And so he stood there dumbfounded. Now, we figured that out later when he answered. But he stood there for a minute, and then he said, well, you know, it's like, like a green onion. Uh, he, he said, we call it aniani, which is not what they call it, but... He's just grasping at straws because he didn't want to look foolish. He had an answer for everything. It didn't matter what you asked him, except for one time, and I'm not going to get into that, but uh, it, it didn't matter what was going on. If you asked him a question, he would give you an answer. And it could be the farthest thing from the truth. But that's how Bildad was. He's going to have an answer for everything. He may not know anything about what's going on. He may not know what he's talking about. He may be totally wrong in everything he says, but he's going to have something to say. And that was Bill Dad. So let's go on to Zophar. Because, obviously, it's got to get better, right? <laughs> Zophar is the man with the made-up mind. And that doesn't sound like it's going to get any better. Because where, where Eliphaz sort of, he, he sort of suggested that Job might be a great sinner, and where Bill Dad supposed that Job was a great sinner, Zophar just came right out and said, yeah, you've sinned. You are a great sinner. Yeah, you're just no good. Uh, and that's all there is to it. Look here in, in chapter 11, in verses 5 and 6. It says, but oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee, and that he would show thee the secrets of wisdom, that they are double uh, to that which is. Know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thine, own, than thine iniquity to serve it. So it's like, look, you just better be thankful God didn't give you what you really deserve. What kind of a friend is that? But that's what he did. Now, look, one thing that we should learn from this is that this is not how to be a friend. This is not the way to do people. Even when people are being judged by God, how do we know? God doesn't send me an email and tells me that, you know, the reason my wife has all the problems she does is because of sin in her life. I'm pretty sure that's true, but no, I'm kidding about that. But what I'm saying is none of us know for us to come to the conclusion that you're having these problems because you've sinned. For us to do that is a huge assumption on our part. And to be quite honest, we're taking the place of God. Now think about that for a minute. We are setting ourselves up as the judge of other men. 